we are really uh, very glad for the people who are going to be helping us with tonight's session. Um, this is a, a program being offered tonight by the Rotary District 6270 DEI committee. Um, our committee is strongly committed to ensuring that we continue in the history of Rotary to be inclusive, diverse, equitable, and welcoming. We want clubs to ensure that their environments um, are welcoming from accessible locations to the ability to hear or see presentations, to feeling welcomed with a voice and an option. Welcome. Uh, folks, uh, the, the background for my speaking tonight is that I lost uh, uh, my wife, Carol, about six weeks ago to, um, well, two issues, uh, memory and um, uh, severe macular degeneration. So uh, we discovered that that is a nasty combination. And happily, not often uh, experienced. But it, in thinking about um, what I've been asked to talk about is something about the experiences that I had and just thoughts. And Angie knows me well enough that she was confining me way beyond my normal uh, instinct by saying I only had 10 minutes. So uh, <laughs> this, this will be fun to see how it, it turns out. To start with, um, I think it's important for people to understand that when this happens in the family, and it's amazing how often it happens, in Carol's side of the family, it was multiple. She has a 93-year-old sister who's been in care for 15 years. Now, later on, if I have the time, I'll say something about how families make decisions around people with dementia, because that, that can be... Uh, well, they, that can change situations dramatically. So I would start out by saying memory problems have a total variety of duration. Um, in Carol's case, it was approximately five years. Um, I was able to take care of her for about four and a half at home. And then she went to a wonderful place called uh, Silverado North Shore. And she was there for about eight months. Um, uh, received wonderful care. And there, that, that whole facility is memory. Uh, so they, they, they're specializing in it. It isn't just a small unit off of a much bigger, we can take care of seniors at any level sort of operation. So um, that I, I felt from the beginning that made a difference. The fact that it goes on at great length has to do with uh, uh, all sorts of factors, I think, uh, not the least of which is for families to understand that dementia, memory care, Alzheimer's, whichever one you want to call it, and they're used pretty interchangeably, um, uh, that it is um, it's something that's going to be impacted upon by all sorts of things. Let me just give you some examples. If you are taking care of somebody with memory problems and you happen to be sitting in a setting where your children have <laughs> happily located right near you, Maybe they have grandchildren that are there and old enough to drive, and you have all kinds of help to get you in and out. In Carol and my situation, it was a little different. Our kids are all over, the, our three kids are all over the country, and all five grandchildren, I say, I say have uh, located as far as they could from grandma and grandpa and still stay in the continental United States. They're all, they're all on the coast. So that makes a huge difference. And I'm trying to, um, uh, I guess you'd use the word coach, but it, it, to, to help people that are uh, taking care of spouses uh, in the early stages. 
Now, I touched upon something there with the early stages. I must say that there is now a drug out that can be given to people with Alzheimer's if you catch it at a very early stage, it does not cure it, but it simply slows or stops the process. It's only been out a year. It's uh, by a Japanese company, and it's, I won't try to pronounce it, but it's spelled E-I-S-A-I -S -S is the name of the company. And the product's name is spelled L-E-Q-E-M. Uh, B.I. So that's out there now. And it, it in its first year, it seems to be um, it seems to be working. So uh, that that's hopeful. That's hopeful. But it is not a cure. So when people have this, they there isn't it isn't like a 40 year old gets cancer. And, and has kids they're bringing up, and you're gonna to fight to the very end to keep them alive as long as you, as you can. Um, for memory care people, you know, at the front end, you just notice that there's stuff happening. They may still be driving, they may still be doing all sorts of things. Um, maybe doing some things that are beneficial, like being serving on a board or being part of a rotary club or whatever. Um, but as it progresses, and you have to start making decisions like my wife or my husband should not be driving anymore. The, the one thing I would say from my experience is, and I'm finding this with the people I'm coaching, the person seldom ex, uh, accepts some of the things that need to be modified in their lives coming from their partner. <laughs> that just, that doesn't work real well. Uh, it, it is uh, worthwhile to get, say, someone like a, a sometimes the children ha can have more impact than the partner. Uh, sometimes it's somebody else in the family. But whether it is getting them out from behind the wheel or turning over the family finances to somebody else, uh, those kinds of things can be very challenging. And, um, and it, 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 often one needs help, um, even though you are pretty darn sure that the person needs to take this step, because they may not be very accepting of it. Um, I just will say a quick word. If there are other health issues involved, and I don't mean to sound cruel in this, please don't interpret it that way, but one has to decide when you're going to attack and keep attacking these other issues. Now, let me give you an example. Carol's sister that's been in care for 15 years, is 93 years old, has no sense of what's going on and weighs about 90 pounds. A little over a year ago, her children decided to put a pacemaker in her. Now, I'm not trying to sound judgmental, but why in the heavens, and they know it now. Now they, you know, they'll call me and they'll say, Uncle Carl, we think we made a terrible mistake. We put a pacemaker in mom. To what end, I said, to what end, guys? That's what you ask yourself. And uh, to what end? So those were a few things. Um, um, you, you, you need to think about it. It's really, really hard to decide whether you're gonna put the person on the pacemaker, on oxygen. Uh, there are people, there are people whose families, you know, it, it, it's, it's a common thing with dementia that people uh, either forget how to eat or just become totally uninterested in eating anything. 
Well, I know that there are memory people that are now plugged in and they're feeding them intravenously. You know, I, I felt blessed in Carol's case because I had had, well, because I'd had cancer 13 years ago. At that point, we talked about, you know, what do you want me to do, Carl? And we talked about that for each other. And it was very clear that we didn't, we didn't want things like that to happen. That's a conversation that's well worth having before, before um, a couple or family members uh, get into that situation. So those are a few of the things that I, I was thinking of. Um, um, I know that we might spend a little time and, and maybe I'm sure my time's up, but if Angie isn't. Yes, Carl, if you could take a couple more minutes and then we'll open it up for some Q&A. Okay. All right. We... Um, you know, I know that there are all kinds of considerations for people from the cost of a facility, uh, you know, to uh, where it's located. Um, but I, I would just say, if a person needs to make a decision to place a family member, take the time to take scouting trips. I was fortunate. Our two girls came here and they saw 15 places. They brought it down to what they called the final five. And then I went. Actually, I added one to it and went to six. But, um, you know, I didn't even want to know what their favorite was until after I'd gone. I, I wanted to see if my favorite matched their favorite. You know, but just little things like that can be uh, maybe helpful to you. So um, those if, are a few thoughts, and I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Thank you. And you guys, we even did a tech run before this, so I'm not, I think that there's very poor bandwidth here, and I do apologize for that disruption. But do any of you attending tonight have a question for Carl? If you would just raise your hand, if you don't know oh, how to do it in the down below under uh, reactions. Well, there's Pete has a question. He's talking Jim has a question. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask Carl if he's heard anything about um, an organization called Care Patrol. Um, they are uh, a, essentially a guide operation that uh, their their business is to know all of the uh, memory care and uh, related facilities in a given market. And <clears throat> we had um, we had a situation recently with my wife's cousin where we use them. And I'm, I'm wondering if Carl has anything to uh, to add about, about them and their mission. And I don't know that particular firm. There are a number of them out there. Uh, one of the challenges of my situation was that Carol never, ever wanted anyone to come and stay with her. Um, if the children were in town, she would be fine with them. But even very close women friends who volunteered to come and help, let alone somebody from a, a you know, an agency, a well, company. Um, she, I don't want anybody coming here babysitting me and sitting there looking at me, you know. So that was just one of the reactions that I dealt with. And I'm and I know that there are people that have used these agencies and been helped by them absolutely but um i really just didn't have experience with them because uh my dear girl just rejected uh the notion that somebody was going to be sitting there with her and and she she loved the expression of babysitting her so <laughs> Yeah, I, I think they're not very well named because that's the impression that I get from the name as well. But they're essentially a, uh, a resource who will um, discuss the uh, how the person is doing, what their 
uh, what they're looking for, the the kind of facility they would be most comfortable in. Yeah. And they, they help you boil it down to maybe two or three possible facilities. Right. And they were immensely well, helpful in our case. Yeah, I would, I would say also that um, here in Ozaukee County, and I'm sure there are people like that in other county agencies, but there is a, a, um, a memory specialist here in Ozaukee County. Her name's uh, Sarah Prohushka. And she, uh, I was so fortunate early on that I took her six week course. I mean, it was two hours oh, wow. each week for six weeks. And it was, I believe, the materials were prepared by a couple of professors at Emory, if I recall correctly. And um, that was a wonderful course. She's a wonderful resource for the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, Carl, and, if I can interrupt. Uh, that, was, that course, I mean, I learned so much. I mean, I just a quick example, folks. I'm sitting there one day and Sarah, you know, flips the camera and we get a different set of slides up there. And she said, now, one of the things we ought to touch is that very often people with memory problems uh, lose their peripheral vision. And I, I about had, you know, I was having trouble breathing. I thought, oh my God, she's got macular. Now she's got, see people with macular often lose the direct sight, but they keep some peripheral. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And so when we got to the question and answer, I put my hand up and she called on me. And I said, I said, uh, Sarah, can the eye doctors tell whether the person has lost their peripheral vision? And she got a smile on her face and she said, oh my, no. They can't see it because they haven't lost the vision in their eyes. They've lost it in their brains. And I, I was, I thought they were going to have to resuscitate me. You know, I mean, I thought, oh my God, is, is my girl's got another potential problem. So that's Carl. good. And Carl, if you could move, Carol, uh, you have a question. Um, we, it's more of a kind of a riff on on Pete's comment too, and I see that Rob or no Susan had made a comment. Um, first of all, when people are looking for help and resources, I think the first thing we should bring up is the Alzheimer's Association. And I have happen to be a little biased because I'm on the board of the Wisconsin chapter, but. There are free resources that the Alzheimer's Association provides and the website I'll put in the chat. But um, when my mom had dementia and my dad was her caregiver, we didn't use all the resources, even though I was an elder law attorney for how many years before mom had dementia, but we didn't use all the resources. And so the Alzheimer's Association has great resources on finding assisted living and, and has support groups that are free and all kinds of other information. But on the care, on the picking and assisted living, it is really important to get educated on the type of company you're working with. Because, and this is not a slight; it's an observation of differences. Okay, Care Patrol and a place like Susan said, a place for mom, they get paid commissions by the place they choose. There are other entities like geriatric care managers, and the one I can think of in our area is called Embrace Care Management. There's also Stoll. There are also a number of other ones. Um, you pay them on an hourly basis for the work they do. So understanding the different types of help you can get to find care is also a really important part of, of the process. So I just wanted to, to, say, to say that. And Diane will be sharing a little bit later about Alzheimer's Association. Are there any other questions for Carl before we move on? If not, again, my deepest apologies. And Carl, thank you. Um, You're welcome. You, you've been through the journey as a Rotarian. Some of you may remember that Carl is a past sister governor in Rotary and was longtime membership chair as well. So he he's embedded in Rotary. He knows people in the district. And um, I'm very grateful that you were willing to share your story. And you are a great um, 
resource as well, because he's also sitting on the Ozaki County Aging and Disability Board, and you are the chair, correct? Uh, that's that's what they tell me for another <laughs> year and three months. Not that I'm counting, you understand. But... Uh, okay. So one of the things that we really want all of you to know and those watching the recording is that, um, again, as Rotary and really proactively engaging in DEI and helping people understand that it's inclusive, it's very inclusive, it includes all of you, it includes all of us. And Alzheimer's and creating dementia-friendly communities is part of that as well. And we hope that we will continue to find ways to make our meetings accessible to our elderly members so that they don't have to leave Rotary. Um, if you aren't doing virtual meetings, think about doing that or having someone who can pick them up and be responsible to bring them to the meetings or you know, lead, lead them to a club where they can join virtually. I've heard from so many Rotarians that they appreciate that their club is virtual so that they can continue to be in Rotary. I did want to also take a minute to introduce, we do have a number of people uh, attending tonight that are on the committee. We have Len Iaquinta, we have Maria Flores, Peter Bosch, Diane Milner, and Natraj Shankar, myself. And we are open to having additional members and or that you become an advocate uh, to help relay the DEI information that we are doing at a district level back to your clubs. Tonight, you're gonna find out is an hors d'oeuvre. You're gonna hear a presentation, you're gonna be, oh, I want more, I want more, but it's not the full meal. It's to develop some awareness. And if you need more information, we hope we'll give you those resources to be able to check out. So department. Um, with that, I want to introduce Diane Milner, who is with the Alzheimer's Association and is going to share a little bit of information with you as well. Thank you very much. Um, now I am having technical difficulties. What's going on here? Okay, I am Even going to, all this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but okay, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to watch a very quick video. Did I, am I sharing? Yes. Am I, okay. Yes. All right. Getting headaches. I felt my here. side go numb. I yes. developed uh, chronic hives all over my body. I would lose my appetite. I hit the floor. My best friend referred to me as skinny, speckled, and sad. I would feel tension and tightness in my back. I had collapsed after a particularly long day of caregiving. As a caregiver for someone living with Alzheimer's, it's easy to put off taking care of yourself. But looking after your own health is not only important, it is critical. The Alzheimer's Association has resources to help. Recognizing the symptoms of caregiver stress is the first step to preventing burnout. Symptoms include depression, sleeplessness, irritability, and other mental and physical health issues. Just as each person's experience with Alzheimer's is unique, the ways you care for yourself can be too. Try different approaches to find what works best for you, like these caregivers. As a caregiver, it's really important to build that deep bench of support, not only for your loved one, but also for yourself. I would try to eat as well as I could, try to eat nutritious foods. I found it extremely helpful to write stuff down, keep a journal that celebrated those great moments. Consider these tips to take care of yourself. Talk to a doctor if you're struggling with stress. Know you're doing your best. Get the support you need with Alzheimer's Association resources in your community. It almost doesn't matter what you do, but do something for yourself to change the subject and get some relief. To learn more about caregiver stress and tips to manage it, please visit alz.org care.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Alzheimer's Association. And just like Angela said, our inclusion is so important, making sure that we make everything accessible for everybody. And as, as a member of the Alzheimer's Association, one of my, I guess you would call it soapboxes, is caregivers and caregiver stress. And uh, just as Carl was talking about in his talk, and, and he's been through it, he's been through it all. Um, it is so important. Self-care is care. You can't care from an empty vessel. So it is so important to take care of yourself as caregivers. And as you, as you see your neighbors, your friends, different people going through this, help them, help them to find resources for themselves, direct them to the Alzheimer's Association, direct them to the um, ADRCs, any place where they can also reach out and get help, whether that's through our um, alz.org, our website, or through the 800 helpline. And our 800 helpline is 1-800-272-3900. It is available 24 seven, and it is available in 72 different languages. So that's about as inclusive as it can get. So we definitely want to make sure that that information is available for all caregivers. And we also have a, a complete um, uh, information source for people that have what we call MCI or mild cognitive impairment. So someone may feel and may have been previously diagnosed with some early stages of the dementia uh, process. And again, that 800 number is available to them. And I encourage you to share that number as often and as widely as possible. I'm not going to talk long. I just want to tell you that, um, again, we serve the state of Wisconsin Alzheimer's Association. We provide re reliable information and care consultations, supportive services for families, educational opportunities, funding for dementia research, and advocacy efforts and policy changes across the state. That's who we are. That's what we do. And um, more information is available as you need it. Feel free to reach out to me personally. You can find me through um, Rotary, or you can find me if you call that 800 number, they will connect you to me. Um, Diane, would you be able to put the uh, phone number that you gave and the website and then your information in, into the chat? I sure will. Absolutely. Perfect. And, um, you know, I'm just going to end with something that I just ran across, and it's called the 10 absolutes. Again, my soapbox is caregiving. And so this is the 10 absolutes. It was courtesy of Joe Huey from her book, Alzheimer's Disease, Help and, and Hope. And it's number one, never argue, instead agree. Number two, never reason, instead divert. Number three, never shame, instead distract. Number four, never lecture, instead reassure. Number five, never say remember, Instead, just reminisce. Number six, never say I told you. Instead, repeat as often as you have to. Number seven, never say you can't. In instead, say do what you can. Number eight, never command or demand. Instead, ask or model. Number nine, never condescend. Instead, encourage and praise. And number 10, never force instead reinforce. Again, I was a caregiver. I cared for my mother with dementia. And this right here is what we need to practice as caregivers, whether we're in a club meeting and we notice someone is, is, is exhibiting signs of dementia, remember these things, okay? I'll put those that information in the chat and I'll let us go on to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm an attraction because I'm, I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Milwaukee. And uh, my mother was uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's in India. And, and to Diane's point, uh, my brother and sister-in-law were the primary caregivers. And in one of the trips I made to India, I found that they were um, losing, losing it themselves in, in many ways. So I decided that I would go every three months for a month and get them out of the house and spend time with my mother and while they got a break. And the point number one that Diane had in her 10-point list 
of don't disagree but agree is one of the most important things I learned in my life. The moment you contradict a person with that dementia, you are liable to have a very interesting negative conversation. Uh, rather than if you agree with them, uh, you are likely to engage in a conversation after about two minutes, they forget about them, what they're talking about and the topic is something different. I'm going to talk about the resources that we have in... Yeah. There we go. There you go. Okay. So these are the Rotary affiliated resources and organizations that I am part of. And as, as a result of my experience with my mother and, and learning about Alzheimer's and dementia across the world, some of which, in, for example, in India, it's a taboo to even talk about it. Um, you do not. It's better to keep your uh, family member isolated because there are a lot of social and cultural contexts or uh, consequences that can happen. So as a result of that, I sort of said, I'm going to be doing something to change the world, at least in India. And I set up, I helped set up the uh, a couple of organizations in India, which is the Alzheimer's and Dementia Rotary Action Group. This was started in South Carolina, I would say, uh, a couple, many years back. And it's an affiliation of multiple organizations with Alzheimer's Association, Report, which is Rotarians Easing Problems with Dementia, Music Men's Minds, which is an organization of California that actually helps uh, create an a, 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 a ecosystem of uh, individuals suffering from dementia, but can still play music, create orchestras. Um, Cure Alzheimer's Fund, which is investing a lot of money and looking at the investment in terms of required to uh, 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 look at how Alzheimer's can be addressed. And CART, which is Coin Coins for Alzheimer's Research Trust, which is a Rotary-sponsored organization, which is uh, part of a uh, uh, sort of a process by which money is collected from Rotarians and invested in research. And I'll get to more of that. Alzheimer's and Dementia Rotary Action Group is focused on pa uh, patient, fa family, and communi uh, community education, patient care, prevention, research, and strategic partnerships. And I'm on the board of that. And what, what, what we try to do is, what I do not try, we actually do, is, is help uh, Rotarians and Rotaractors uh, become aware of what Alzheimer's about and help them along the journey in terms of these five different areas. So Alzheimer's Association is part of uh, the Alzheimer's and Dementia Rotary Action Group. And, and, and to that extent, uh, we sponsor uh, the walk to Alzheimer's, uh, to end Alzheimer's across the whole of Wisconsin. And Rotary clubs in these areas of Wisconsin have participated in the walk. And my sort of uh, 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 call to action here is to spread the word such that each and every Rotary club has a team that walks to end Alzheimer's. There is also the ability when you register the club and you join the walk to associate that walk with Alzheimer's and Dementia Road Reaction Group because there are millions of individuals across the country who are part of ADRAG who are walking. And it helps Rotary expose and, and market and, 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 and sort of uh, 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 interact with individuals to say, look, we are part of the fight to end Alzheimer's. The other group that is uh, 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 I talked about with CART, it's Coin, Coins for Alzheimer's Research Trust. It was started in 1995 by a gentleman by the name of Roger Ackerman, who uh, eventually passed away uh, in, with Alzheimer's. And the, the, the basic idea that Roger came up with is he had a blue bucket that was in, in every Rotary Club, 
And in those days, I guess in 1995, people had a lot of change in their pocket. So they just dumped all the change in, in, in the, into the bucket. This was collected and CART collected that info, that uh, the, that uh, uh, donation, if you may, from each club. And that was used to fund research in Alzheimer's. And I'll get into that a little more in detail. Today, there are about 450 Rotary Clubs, most of them on the East Coast. And while that is expanding, um, our, uh, we are trying to look at how our district can be part of this whole process and be a, one of the sponsors of a, a, a research that CART is sponsoring. Um, again, it's, it's minimal amount of donation. It's $5 a month. And if that, if if you have, a, if you're if you're looking at how that can happen, um, there are there is a, a, a portal or a, a web page in CART where clubs can register themselves and get individuals to contribute automatically five dollars a month. If you have any questions or how to set this up for your club. Contact me, and my contact information is on the last slide. Uh, CART, for example, is going to be giving one point four million dollars this year. These I'm not going to read through these, but these are the research areas in terms of where CART is is focused on. Um, you know, and some of these things I don't even understand because there are fairly deep scientific or and uh, biological uh, uh, concepts. But the point is, until and unless they can find ways to stop it, slow it, or cure it, it's going to be something that we have to live with. And that's where CART is focused on. The other area that I'm working with is Dementia Friendly America. They, I, 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 my, my hope and prayer is that in the five different organizations that I talked about earlier on, Alzheimer's Association, Report, uh, CART, and, and the other ones, I hope Dementia Friendly America also becomes part of ADRAG. I am part of an organization in, in Shorewood. It's called DOG, Dementia uh, Awareness Work Group. And they uh, and 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 dementia it's 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 a sort of a strain or a extent uh, of dementia friendly America is the corporate umbrella if you may dementia friendly communities is what this is about so Shorewood is a dementia friendly community and one of the things that we do is memory cafes and for example two weeks back on Saturday uh, we had a we had Marty uh, Schreiber, who was the former governor of uh, 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 Wisconsin, um, whose wife passed away uh, uh, with Alzheimer's, and he gave an amazing sp talk. And his speech or his talk was only about 10, 15 minutes. The rest of the time was him asking the audience about what their journey was and how he could help them. So Shorewood now is recognized as, a, as the best intergenerational community in the country by Generations United. And I believe that this is the way that we need to create uh, dementia from the communities. If each Rotary Club became a nodal point of a dementia-friendly community, where the community could come and get information about it for both Rotarians and non-Rotarians, it would be the ultimate dream. Not sure uh, here has that process going on and multiple areas and the North Shore Mental Health uh, uh, support system is, uh, is amazing in terms of the fact that we are doing all these uh, uh, different strategies. So this is uh, my uh, information, um, the email, my address, if you have any questions about either how to set up a uh, dementia from the community, uh, what we call memory cafes, uh, helping with the uh, the extent of how we could each Rotary Club could become a cart member, and or 
how you could leverage the ex the experience and the uh, uh, extent of what ADRAG or um, uh, Alzheimer's and Dementia Rotary Action Group does, send me an email, call me, and I can help you out. Natraj, thank you very, very much. And I think the other thing to mention that often Rotarians are surprised to find out is that Rotary International has entered into a formal partnership with Alzheimer's Association. So this isn't just something that's kind of on the side. This is actually an initiative within Rotary. Now, I'd be remiss in not saying that we are still, our number one project in Rotary is to fight to end polio, and we're close, but we do recognize that to be inclusive, we are definitely needing to do more to create dementia-friendly communities, and Alzheimer's Association is truly a great partner in that. Um, I do want to introduce now Carol Giuliani, who um, is the owner of Senior Travel Companion Services, and they provide customized trip planning and travel escort for individual seniors and couples. And she and uh, Jan Doherty are authors of Travel Well with Dementia, and where they train and certify others um, in this new industry and start independent businesses around supporting uh, people to attend weddings or go on vacation or relocating. And Carol, if you would take a minute to tell us about the Sunflower Lanyard Initiative. Okay, sure. And I did send a couple pictures yep, out. I will share that screen now. Angela, right. And uh, with, along with the dementia friendly communities, um, we are on a committee that's called Dementia Friendly Airport Working Group, which is an Alzheimer's started um, outfit in Minnesota here where I'm from that uh, has been working with an international group to bring the sunflower lanyard to all the airports worldwide to uh, uh, introduce this concept that people who are wearing this necklace, this is the card that um, introduces this to people, but there's a necklace that goes along with it. Uh, here it is. That people that wear this at the um, airports will be recognized by those participating airports to see to um, be recognized by the airport personnel, the TSA particularly, um, that uh, here is an individual that has a hidden disability, including dementia. So Alzheimer's, dementia, any kind, um, Parkinson's, autism, uh, vision loss, anything like that. The TSA has been trained by these, um, by our group, the Dementia Friendly Airports Working Group with videos and uh, national shift brief uh, by Tipa Snow and other people that are dementia experts and myself included to uh, take the to be careful that the caregivers that are along with these folks that are traveling professionals like myself that actually go through and fly with these individuals to make sure that for Carl and other people that have loved ones traveling to get back to their families to spend their golden years with them at the end of their lives uh, comfortably and safely can travel through the airport through the TSA uh, have these necklaces on, the TSA recognize them, they stay with their caregivers and they are um, uh, treated uh, with dignity and respect. That's the whole goal of this. Uh, not to get special privileges, but to be treated with dignity and respect. Uh, this um, sunflower is an international symbol. It's been picked up by many airports throughout the United States. And now it's being picked up by uh, United Airlines, uh, Air Canada, and um, arenas, uh, worship centers, um, everything, and, and dementia communities are starting to subscribe to the um, to the program so that other, uh, you know, it's just getting to be the big international symbol so people can recognize it and see that there's something going on with individuals without knowing exactly maybe what it is. Uh, you can uh, identify what's going on on the, um, on the, on the back of the, um, lanyard in case somebody gets lost in an airport they can find out what's going on there's a, a phone number so that they could be reunited with their loved one if that's the situation so i just wanted to introduce this and there's some information about my um, services and you can contact me more about the dementia friendly airport working group and the sunflower hidden disability program we do work with the um, alzheimer's association with the aarp and many many other organizations to bring this um program, this scheme, as they call it in the UK, where it was started, uh, to every airport we can get it to, uh, including the Milwaukee airport. If you see that sunflower out there, you know we're par you're participating. I was just there last weekend. And so thank you very much. And please reach out to me. 
my sister's the um, president at the Elmbrook Rotary, and she, when she saw that you're um, taking care to be inclusive at your Rotary Club, she said, oh, Carol, you got to be talking to these folks and let them know about this sunflower. So I appreciate you folks, and thanks for including me today. Oh, thank you, Carol. And Rob, as a former uh, very connected to the airport in Milwaukee, it looks like you have a question or a comment. I, yeah, my, my question, um, Carol, the uh, QR code has got a sunflower in the middle of it. Um, I assume that uh, provides some sort of information uh, when somebody scans it. That's what it's there for, yep. Um, what kind of information? Uh, you know, I haven't really looked at it lately, but I think it's going to tell you where to go for the website, uh, the Hidden Disabilities website. You can get these lanyards at the information booths at the airports um, before you go through the TSA screening. Um, sometimes after you go through the screening also, and you can also get them online. So before you go to the airport, um, you can get the uh, lanyards and you can put them on your individual uh, to go through the screening. And it will also tell you what the program's about and how you can support it. It's my understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not it's not individualized to the uh, the wearer then. It's uh, it's more for the program. Okay. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But many of us did not know about this program, so we're glad to hear about it. And again, continuing to share information that helps us all create dementia-friendly communities. Um, at this time, I'm going to go back to sharing and my screen. Um, let me see if I'm able to go forward. Yes, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I do want everyone to realize that this is not something new. Um, Rotary clubs have been participating as Natraj mentioned, the CART program was started back in, uh, I believe it was the nineties you had said Natraj. And there are samples or examples of clubs all over the world. Uh, the Rotary Club of Dunwoody had a partnership with uh, two communities and Rotary clubs in Italy. It was a global grant supported program for dementia and Alzheimer victims. And if you want more information, all you have to do is actually Google Rotary Club of Dunwoody and Italy and uh, Alzheimer's or dementia. And you can find out more about it, but they had great results in finding that by making uh, services more available, people were getting the help they needed. They were starting to break down the stigma that was being very much carried with it. So that is one example. We also have um, this is the global grant that was done um, back with uh, a number of clubs. The Dunwoody was one of them. This is a little bit more about it if you want to screen shoot it and keep it for le later. We have um, in England, there was a Rotary Club that raised uh, 23,000 uh, pounds for research. And again, one club, and they were doing rubber ducky sales and things of that nature. Uh, we have many clubs throughout the world, including the United States, that are doing uh, walks to end Alzheimer's. Last year at the Ozaki uh, Walk, I manned a booth as well to share with people about the partnership that we have with Alzheimer's Association and to share some of the other, what clubs were doing. Um, as a reminder, in uh, September, there are a number of walks. And for those in the uh, webinar tonight, Ozaki County is September 28th. I believe Diane put that in the chat. Milwaukee County is September 15th. Those of you who are in Washington or Walworth or Fox counties, Fox Cities area, uh, you're on September 14th. Those of you down in um, Kenosha, and Racine are September 21st, and Oshkosh is uh, September 28th. So they're all over our entire uh, Rotary District. So if you, if I didn't mention one, and you need to find out, Diane's a great contact for that, or Natraj. Um, but we really hope that you'll go back to your clubs and you'll do what you can to inspire them to participate in a walk. Um, Portland, Oregon Rotary did information, a presentation. They shared about the CARTS program and what uh, folks could do in their community. So there are a number of resources available. We want people to really 
take this back to their clubs. It's part of the DEI welcoming, inclusive part of Rotary. Um, I don't know how many of you remember seeing the article November 2023 that was in the Rotary magazine. And it was um, a person who was a writer and living with Alzheimer's while being a writer. And it was a very um, informative and eye-opening article. And I do want to remind everyone that everybody has a different journey. No one journey is the same as the next person's journey, but there's a lot we can learn from each other. The other thing that um, Pat Merriweather, who's a director for Rotary International, sent me an email and said, I hope you're going to talk about the guide program. And the challenge was that even though there's a partnership or that Alzheimer's Association knows about this, not everybody has been clued into it yet. Evidently, it's going to be ready July 1st. It's going to be an eight-year program. And evidently, there's some work happening with CMS to develop this guide model that's going to have, it's kind of like wraparound services of working with caregivers, working with people with dementia, working with centers, um, even with their insurance, et cetera. I don't know enough about it to really say, hey, this is what the guide program is, but put it on your radar screen to start noticing it. And evidently it's going to be launched and ready by July 1st of this year. Um, and there's going to be measured outcomes to see how this program uh, supports families and those with dementia. They're projecting that it could save nearly 21 billion over 10 years and improve the quality of life for those living with dementia and their families. I'm going to stop the share there. And again, um, we just really appreciate the people who come to the table tonight to share knowledge and information. And at this time, I'd like to open it up for any questions that any of you might have. If you don't know how to do the reaction of raising your hand, just raise it and we'll watch for you <laughs> and call on you. Karen has her hand Karen. raised. Thank you. I had a question for Carl. Um, you mentioned at, really early on that most people don't realize or maybe even will admit that they are struggling with dementia or memory issues. So how do you walk through um, getting those individuals to accept help or resources? Well, that's uh, that's <laughs> that's one of the challenges as I put it out there. I think, again, it's not only like the, um, the, the length of a person's having uh, the memory loss, but it's also what they will accept. I mean, uh, I've got one person that I'm trying to help whose uh, family member that has it is totally willing to have someone come and spend time with them, even if they aren't family, even if they aren't friends. Um, where Carol was very resistant to it. And she was, uh, as uh, one caregiver at uh, Silverado said one time, uh, Carol wasn't eating at the end. And one night she said, oh, Carol, can I help you with your food? Wouldn't you like to have something to eat? And Carol said, no. And the caregiver said to me, you know, your wife can say no more sweetly than anybody I've ever run into. <laughs> I mean, you know, she would make, she would make people just feel awful if they tried to press her because she was so sweet to them. And so I think it, it's a, just another area where it's all over the map. It, you you probably it, my thought would be you have to experiment. You have to experiment. You have that's, not so much a question, but a, an addition to Natraja's uh, presentation. Uh, I put uh, the music men's minds in the uh, chat. Uh, um, we picked up a, a, a new member in our Rotary Club based on that. Uh, she was a, a retired uh, music professor, and uh, she contacted the people on the West Coast uh, and attended some of their sessions. And uh, they said, find a local Rotary Club and join them and get involved. And uh, she found our club, joined us, and uh, coincidentally, it was at the same time the uh, Salvation Army was looking to put together a senior program. But uh, the website uh, is is interesting. They do a uh, 
uh, a Zoom call three days a week uh, where people call in. They have a uh, it's like a, a disc jockey uh, in the in the uh, one of the boxes, and she plays songs that people have requested, and they sing. And it's it's amazing to see the difference between a person just sitting there looking, and all of a sudden they start singing, and they're involved. Um, it's something that I wished I had known uh, when when my mother was uh, going through her phase uh, um, before she passed away, because she, you know, the, I'm sure that the music would have made a big difference in her life. But uh, that's something that. Uh, um, you know, I, we discovered too late, but, uh, it's, it's a, it's a resource that works well. Thank you, so, Rob. So to Rob's point, one of the things that I noticed when I was spending the month with my mother was that while she was in her own world, the one thing that really brought her to her sense or her reality was music she, uh, so if i played a song that she learned when she was a child she could sing that song to the note to the rhythm and belt it out which is with perfect harmony and so one of the things that mu music does to the brain is it brings out a certain captured emotion that is never lost and music is a Im incredible pacifier for people with uh, alzheimer's and dementia if i could quickly add to that um pet therapy has been shown that when people are agitated and a pet is introduced that that call is very calming and for days, they will vocalize or verbalize where they maybe have been silent for days or even weeks. So again, uh, there's an organization called Pets Helping People in Milwaukee that is very good at supporting as well as, as you said, Natraj, music, huge. And dance, they're finding that that dance and movement or even uh, uh, things in the pool. Yeah, it, it, one of the things I would say in the music department is, finding the music that they love uh you know it, it carol if she knew the songs and i had the same experience that the gentleman that spoke um referred to but she wanted to she wanted to hear the songs like frank sinatra songs mm -hmm. like you know she <laughs> She wasn't going to do country. She wasn't going to do rock and roll. Yeah. She liked she liked classical music, but it had to be just right. It, it, it had to be soft and, you know, so finding the right, um, I guess you'd say the right tone, the right music, uh, their music. Their music, right. When, it's the music that they grew up with. Yeah, yes. when I, when exactly. I start... When I start drifting off, just throw a little Ozzy Osbourne and some uh, Tesla on there, and uh, and I'll be uh, I'll be humming. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? This was very good. If not, I hope that you'll share this. I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties that we had. Uh, yeah. Just prove that even though you can rehearse and rehearse and check everything out, the the universe chooses to do something different giving you <laughs> new gray hairs. Um, so, um, it's, it, it's the universe's version of dementia. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> might be, might be. But, um, you know, the other thing is, if we haven't mentioned, because I was in and out uh, due to internet, um, Natraj and Diane are available for presentations to your clubs. Um, they're happy to do that live or via um, Zoom. So please help to get the word out, um, help to bring this information to all of your Rotarians. And for those of you who maybe are running up against some folks in your club that DEI has become this lightning rod of, of controversy, we want to change the, the, the meaning around that and actually not change it, but to reinforce that it's not a lightning rod. It's, it's about everybody, it's inclusive. And that includes um, you know, gender, uh, religion, uh, 
their political beliefs, their their way of being, uh, whether they have memory issues or disabilities, or they can't, they're in a wheelchair or they have visual impairments. It's it's everybody. And so help us help our Rotary Clubs understand the full inclusion of DEI. And it's not about excluding or making someone wrong or bad. It just isn't. And we need to keep uh, helping people understand that message. So thank you for joining us tonight. We do have other sessions coming up in another couple months and we'll continue to do them throughout the year. Um, please let us know if there's something you'd like us to cover. And again, reach out to me if you're interested in serving a, a committee, our committee, or you'd like to potentially be a DEI advocate in your club, sharing information and being a conduit of information. Andy, before I stop the recording, um, just a reminder that the Milwaukee County Walk to End Alzheimer is going to be in September 15th, and the Ozaki Walk to End Alzheimer's is going to be on September 28th, and you can go to the uh, Alzheimer's Organization link for more details. And I do want to rem remind you that Carol Wessels is forming a team for the Ozaki County. She put that link in the chat if you need it. I know Diane has it as well. And um, I'm in Ozaki County, and we really want to be part of that. So help us have a large team there this year. Okay. I saw last message. Was there anything else to bring to the attention of everyone before we go? Diane, raise her hand. Diane, do you want me to stop the recording now, or you want it to be in recording? It, it, it can be in recording. I just wanted to let you know that I did put in the chat a program that I am doing through the Alzheimer's Association. It is called Unforgettable, and it is an unforgettable weekend. Um, on June 14th and 15th, we will be hosting a play that was written specifically for the Alzheimer's Association. It will be at the Marcus Center for Performing Arts, downtown Milwaukee. Uh, June 14th is a jazz concert, and June 15th is the play. And both of those will be surrounding the information that you've seen here today about Alzheimer's and dementia. So um, spread the word, uh, come out, reach out to me to get more information. Both events are totally free. We want to fill the auditorium uh, on both, both Friday night at 7 p.m. and Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m. Thank you. And Thank if you. you're someone who's not as comfortable necessarily going to something on your own, um, touch base with us because some of us from the committee, uh, people from around the district will be attending and we'd be happy to connect and and join you at those play uh, times so that you aren't necessarily by yourself. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I will be giving a, a VIP reception. So if you're going, let me know so that I can get the VIP invitation to you. We'll have a reception prior to the play. So that'll be about 1130. Uh, until 1.30 and then the play starts at 2.